What makes a good lawyer show? Is it that you actually do lawyer stuff? Probably. Welcome back to the Salawogs Why It's Great Gut Reaction, where I watch things react from the gut. As you can see, I'm sporting an awesome Spider-Man multiverse shirt, provided my, by my best friend since college. I just thought I'd wear it in honor of uh, She-Hulk. I, uh, I gotta say, I loved the first episode. I don't think it was perfect. Uh, I think there's some room to grow here, but I do think on the whole, as a package as something that continues the MCU uh, presentation, what you might be expecting as just a general fan of the MCU. Uh, one of the things I'll just say I did not like about Falcon and the Winter Soldier and WandaVision was that there was definitely sections where it felt like we were watching a low-budget TV show, where here we were dealing with characters who are essentially on the big screen, with feature film money and their show feels like a show that if it wasn't shot in Canada probably should have been I don't know uh, and I'm really glad that you know especially with Moon Knight I think Moon Knight finally leveled up Moon Knight looked like a, a feature film and She-Hulk looks like a feature film so I'm gonna do some cast and crew shout outs to that to that end very soon but just if you want the gut reaction well 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 did you like it mr sally waggy did you like it mr weird fat man uh i i liked it i liked she hulk uh my love for she hulk goes back to the 90s cartoon again uh not a big comic book reader even though i do have a little short stack i mostly was exposed to superheroes through the animated series in the 90s, which I don't care what anyone says. You know, 80s kids, you can keep crying about your shows, but the 90s cartoons and early 2000s cartoons that came from the 90s had the best writing, best direction. They they had ambition. They wanted to look and feel like a movie. They weren't trying to people please. They were really trying to do something special for their specific audiences. Beast Wars, Gargoyles, uh, Batman the Animated Series, and definitely amongst my favorite shows were the Marvel shows at the time, X-Men, Spider-Man. That X-Men theme still played by every 90s kid making a podcast today. Uh, the Spider-Man theme, again, always played by every 90s kid making a pod. even if they were born in the 80s, and but if they grew up in the 90s watching that Spider-Man, you're always hearing that, now, 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 now. Or the X Men thing, dun 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 There's a reason that every time an X Men film came out, one of the biggest gripes of the audience is why isn't that theme playing? Do you not understand that that is why I am here? And no, they did not understand that because they were adults from the 60s and 70s, and they don't give a fuck about your generation. As far as they're concerned, they know what's what. And, uh, one of, to me, underrated amongst the other two, because, let's face it, Spider-Man, the animated series, was practically untouchable, especially next to the X-Men, the animated series, which was fantastic. But one of my personal favorites, I always related to the Hulk and his emotional ordeals. I really love the Incredible Hulk animated show. I think it Amongst the three, I think those are some of the top three uh, animated intros of all time. I think the Incredible Hulk animated series, that introduction, that main title sequence, was so melodramatic and emotional and dreamlike and visceral and destructive. It really encapsulated the entire Incredible Hulk experience where you could just watch that title sequence over and over and over again and you're getting the entire show experience. 
Uh, and that's that's one of the things that, as a show, it really delivered on the pathos of Bruce Banner and the sort of the feeling of being a lost kid like Hulk. And in preparation for this uh, review, I went back and watched the two She-Hulk introduction episodes from the 90s cartoon that I love so much, Incredible Hulk. Uh, so, okay, let's get into this reaction. Uh, sort of spoiler-free, what did I think of She-Hulk, Attorney at Law? I really had a good time, I think, on a cinematic and production design level. We are finally watching a show that levels up to the cinematic expectations of the general MCU films. My problem with Falcon and the Winter Soldier and parts of WandaVision, uh, I did not feel that on the whole they had actually captured the cinematic look and expectation that the films delivered. I understand if the character is not from the movies, maybe you have a little leeway. You know, I think Miss Marvel had a couple episodes that did not quite fully look like cinema level. Uh, but, I mean, you know, she's not from the movie. She can have a little bit more of a small budget look because she's from a very particular neighborhood, a particular world, and that's fine. Uh, but for these characters who are on the big screen already, they need to have that MCU in theaters look. That's the expectation you have to meet. And what I appreciate about She-Hulk is that just on looks alone, if we're just talking about, you know, was the production design good? Was the cinematography good? Was the directing good? Was the casting good? And this show benefits from the first episode being really about her transformation into She-Hulk. And uh, this version of Bruce Banner, the post-Infinity War smart hulk basically being her guide and giving her some training into how to hulk how to be a hulk and it's a great way to get us back into why we love the hulk but also to just give this character some kind of preparation for what she's getting into so that you can just have this show and and she can just be she hulk without you know i'm sure she'll have some mistakes and things like that that'll be made but, you know, at, at least this gives us a way for the next eight episodes for her to be the She-Hulk and not have to have spend too much time with her struggling to have her powers. So we just had Ms. Marvel that, that was all about struggling to learn how to use your powers. And the thing about She-Hulk is that she's, she's pretty damn good off the, off the top. I think what's interesting difference between the 90s cartoon... In the 90s cartoon, although she's a lawyer... She spends no time being a lawyer, and she's actually introduced uh, being very sporty and, be, and being someone who wants to look good and wishes she had that kind of ultimate body, and is very happy that when she hulks out, and, and another difference, I'm not sure what she's like in the comic book, but in certainly in the cartoon, she could not go back and forth. She was just stuck as She-Hulk, but in the cartoon, she loved it. She was like, oh, I... <laughs> With no effort required, I have become the ultimate physical specimen that I possibly could be. And, you know, and she didn't even care about being green. She rocked being green. Um, I'm still kind of, I still kind of have a crush on She-Hulk from the cartoon, I can't lie. She-Hulk from the cartoon, if, if you're single. Um, peace. What's up? <laughs> anyway, follow me on Instagram. Anyway... <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, animated She-Hulk, I mean, and, uh, also animated She-Hulk, <laughs> starring this lady. I have to say, Tatiana Maslany, am I saying your name wrong? I'm sorry. Uh, Tatiana, I thought, did a fantastic job. Uh, she is splitting that difference of being someone who was a lawyer, who is now a superhero very well. She's got great charisma. She's got great comedy sense. All of that is here in this episode. Um, I'm sure... I'll, I'll get into this more later, but I'm sure there will be some anti-woke, anti... anti... you know, why is the woman being like this to a man stuff. All that, you know, we'll get to that later. But I feel like she was very relatable. I think the best thing about 
the casting of her is the same thing that was great about the casting of Mark Ruffalo, that they have this relatability, they have this sort of human quality, where Robert Downey Jr. was so, he, he played such the narcissistic, untouchable character, that's a character, uh, you have that opposite effect with Mark Ruffalo. But for She-Hulk, She-Hulk is someone who has a sense of humor and is not bothered by the fact that she's a She-Hulk. Now, that is the conflict in this show. Uh, I don't fully agree with it because that was not my introduction to She-Hulk. But I do like that she has some form of conflict in this episode. Um... But I think she plays it very well. Tatiana played it very, very well. Because it is a change and it is a conflict. And that is going to have some kind of reaction from you. Even if you're excited about the benefits of it. I I really enjoyed the whole interplay uh, between these two. As Bruce is trying to show her certain Hulk things. And control your temper and all this stuff. And she's trying to tell him, like, there's a lot of this stuff that I'm already doing uh, as a woman. And I, hey, I think I've had this conversation. Now we're getting into it. Uh, without spoiling too much, they do have this conversation where she's like, as a woman, I'm dealing with anger and frustration all day. But I have to keep it down. Otherwise, people will call me difficult and call me this and call me that. Which, uh, you know, I feel like I've actually had this conversation before with uh, a couple of different women. So, I do like that I've always felt like this particular version of Hulk. I've always felt like, hey, I'm a nice, agreeable kind of guy, but I also have a temper. And I also, I'm a big dude, too. I'm a Samoan, Hawaiian, build, white guy. And that comes with, you know, if I smack into something... Even if I'm just joking around, or if I'm just, if I just fling my gorilla fucking arms around and hit something, then there's going to be a consequence, you know, that I am not a very, you know, these bones, you know, they're not unbreakable, but this, certainly they're built to break. They're built to break other things. And, and, and it's happened many times. So I've kind of always walked around in my life like this kind of too big for my own body kind of deal and Hulk is one of the few fictional characters where I get to kind of agree with like yeah I get what it's like like if you if you don't take your physical movements seriously someone can get hurt just because the way your body was built was built for f absolute fucking destruction uh, even growing up people would always tell me oh you should be a football player you should be a wrestler you should be this you should be that like nah I'm a nerd I'm good but then, now working at a popular retail store, I've learned just how physically strong I'm capable of being. And, uh, and it's, it's an interesting revelation. I'm like, maybe I should have gotten into sports, probably would have made some money. But anyway, yeah, I, I really like the interplay between these two characters. I don't feel at all like they're cousins, but they do feel like good friends. And uh, this is kind of messed up because they are cousins, but I've always kind of felt like aren't you two characters one of the few people who could actually physically have something going on and not have to worry about destroying the other? Because what, especially in the case of She-Hulk, who we'll find later doesn't mind finding love out there, uh, I just can't imagine her not getting into some kind of the boys level scenario. So I do appreciate that this whole episode is about acknowledging that concern and saying that, you know, you're a superhero now, you have superpowers, and you're not like me, you're not a loner, so you need to understand the consequences of what these powers come with. And I would have appreciated if she was She-Hulk the whole time, but I understand uh, budget-wise, budget, budget -wise, you probably have a limitation there. This is the same reason you couldn't just have Lou Ferrigno be Hulk all the time in the original Hulk show. The time, to, the makeup, all that stuff, it takes time. There's budgetary reasons that things happen in shows that have nothing to do with creativity, and have, but ultimately will shape the creativity of the show. And so I, I appreciate that 
even if it's not comic book accurate, they they create this conflict of her not wanting to be the She-Hulk because it gives her something to grapple with in her human form. That she's still concerned about being She-Hulk without having the same pathos as Bruce. Uh, but it allows us to have, have all the fun and know that she could become She-Hulk whenever she wants. It's interesting. It's an interesting choice, and I understand that it's the only choice you can make in a show like this. So, uh, that being said, that was my spoiler-free reaction. Now I'm gonna now I'm gonna spoil this shit. Oh, oh, hey, I'm sorry. I forgot I was doing a podcast. Okay, so Spoiler Free is done. I liked it. Definitely check it out. Uh, I wanted to say, I gotta say, I like the She-Hulk a lot. <laughs> I, you know what's cool about this is that I, I never felt like we got enough time with Bruce Banner in any of the movies. I feel like all this time that we get with Mark Ruffalo's Hulk in this episode is ev it's more of everything I wanted from his Hulk across the movies. And I'll tell you, Universal, Marvel, MCU, Kevin Feige, if you let me make a Hulk movie, I promise you I'll, I will give you something good because I've had something in my head for a long ass time. Uh, the the whole concerns and fears of being a monster are, are really a big part of his side of this show. And uh, I love that we get this epic Hulk versus She-Hulk fight that, that, that is, again, it's on the cinematic level of the rest of the movies. Because if you can't achieve that, to me, I feel the the show, if it's featuring one of the characters who's been in a movie, if you can't achieve that, then I feel that you've failed in a, in a very significant way. Even though it is not the most important part of the show, it's something as a superhero comic book media consumer, as, as a fan of that stuff, it's something that we've come to expect. Because CW, as far as I'm concerned, is the lowest ring of what you expect from a superhero show. Smallville really set the standard for being both cinematic, but still being a show, and also still feeling like it could be connected to a movie in some way, shape, or form, especially in seasons one through seven. Once uh, the main creators of the show stepped off of the show, because I think they told the story they wanted to tell, once it became a true CW show, it was just setting the standard for Arrow and Flash and everything that followed. Not that it was bad, but it definitely was just relying on every all the tropes that worked with the, with the show before. And at the end of the day, that becomes tedious and, and no one really wants to watch the show after a while. You really water down the expectations. And it's just not good for the brand. It's not good for the, the, the character. You get the audience tired of the character. And uh, what I appreciate about the MCU Disney Plus shows is that they are, they're not 22 episodes. They're not meandering. And She-Hulk in particular, I love that this first episode was really tight and had its own encapsulated little tale. I... I I want more of that. I, I'm, I'm not saying that they should be like that necessarily, but it does feel like the sort of introductory 20, 30 minutes of a movie or, or something, and it's just getting us into our universe. Again, I would have really liked something like this for Moon Knight. I, w I hope if they do a Moon Knight season two, we at least get like an origin episode, because I really love 
what Oscar Isaac did with that character. I would love to have watched the origin, origin, the proper origin of Moon Knight uh, like this. I think that this is the only thing that show needed. I think I really love how that show was done. But the only thing that show really needed was to see Mark's perspective. And not, you know, they, they give us like two flashback scenes. That's not good enough. I would have really loved to have seen Mark's perspective on becoming Moon Knight and, and that entire journey and and how he met his wife and all that stuff. And I really like that this show, this She-Hulk first episode gives us that time to breathe and understand the relationship between She-Hulk and Hulk, that, that they do have a family history and that they do have, actually they have more conflict from becoming Hulk. Uh because of all these issues and I I appreciate that even though like I said she doesn't have a personal issue as far as we know in this first episode outside of being She-Hulk I think that does dampen her character but we still get a lot of emotional content from Banner and, and that that's important but I do like that at least she does have some form of conflict in the case of do I want to be this green thing because we need something there. We need something there. I don't feel like Miss Marvel had a personal conflict. Those kind of came from the plot. Uh, like I said, that was kind of a kind of a Lizzie McGuire-y type of show. Uh, but it's important for the the staying power of these shows and movies and characters. It all comes back from the comic books, where they came from. The staying power, the the power of Spider Man is those huge critical moral tale issues those personal issues that make them relatable to us every day of the week you know what i mean i mean i'm not grappling with you know do i want to stop a mugger every day but every time there is a situation where it's like should i get involved should i help this person over there that's a relatable issue that makes spider-man relevant in everyday life every day and in the case of Hulk, should I lose my temper? Should I just let loose and say whatever the fuck I have to say? You know, that is an everyday relatable type of deal. And it still technically applies to She-Hulk. Uh, and I actually, I say, I'll say that I like her, everything she's talking about with Captain America. That's a little thread that I really enjoy. Uh, because she has a theory that Captain America is a virgin and... It's actually, it's kind of done a little, almost too quickly, but I think deliberately too quickly. Uh, so that's kind of swept under the rug. But if you're paying attention to it, the there is an end credit scene. And the end credit scene gives us an answer to her theory. And uh, I just, I gotta say, I, I really love her as a someone we can relate to, I think is the best part of casting her as She-Hulk. And I'm certainly hoping that she becomes more... I mean, I understand if there's a sort of sexist fear about her creation and how she was very voluptuous and, and loving it. I understand if there's certain concerns about that, either from, from women who, who are making it or, or watching it. They don't want to just be the objectified doll who, who's happy to be an objectified doll. I understand if that's a concern and that's part of the shaping of it, but that at least the confidence, at least if she can maintain the confidence of self, I hope that that is what she can have by the end of this show. Uh, she doesn't need to be like that, but if I, I would appreciate at least that much because she is a different character from Hulk. They talk about that in this episode, but... The fact that she has the, the mini the mini conflict about being a She-Hulk is, is still kind of copying uh, Bruce Banner a bit. So I'm hoping that by the finale, at least, that she's fully confident in who she is and, and enjoys being She-Hulk. And hopefully we get more of her just being She-Hulk because that's what she's supposed to be in the freaking thing. Uh, but that being said... Thumbs up, double double thumbs up. I I, I had a good time. I, I I watched this show. I watched this first episode twice because I just enjoyed it so much. I, I and uh, and finally for me, this is what I've always wanted. Going back to that '90s show, I mean, it was fun. It was cool seeing the Hulk fight the thing. 
But it's like I've always wanted to see that stuff in live action because it was so great in animation. Like, wouldn't it be great to see this done real? Wouldn't it be great to see it done on the scale of a movie, you know? And at that time, the only live action stuff we were getting were the Batman movies, and those were going downhill real fast. And it was by the time the Batman movies got good, the animation got bad again, so I don't know what the hell was going on. Uh, but yeah, I just gotta say, I, I really loved this, and uh, I actually want to do some cast and crew shoutouts right now. So now that I've gotten through the reaction of this show, if you're not convinced... Okay, sorry. Uh, but anyway... So, going back to one of my first things I was talking about was, does the show level up to the Marvel Cinematic Universe a la the literal cinematic expectation of the movies? Like I said, that's been my problem with some of these Disney Plus shows. I don't feel that they all leveled up. Uh, I really feel like Moon Knight was the first one to achieve the cinematic expectation. But where does that come from? Where does it come from in the line between the CW, which without question is shot in Canada and looks like it was shot in Canada, and thank you, Great White North, but it looks like a show. I think e even if you look at some of the Marvel movies of the past, I think if you look at Blade 1 and Blade 2, Blade 1 was shot in Los Angeles, Blade 2 shot in Prague, but when we get to Blade Trinity, that was shot in Canada. And that was David Goyer's second whack at directing. And his second whack at directing was this, he went from this very small feature film, which I think was pretty good. Zigzag is pretty good. But when you look at Blade Trinity, you know, he, you see he is really relying on his crew for a lot of this more cinematic elements because some of the scenes and shots in that movie look very low budget it looks like we're in canada i don't feel like just i'm mean, just from my general knowledge of film and tv just watching it you kind of get that sense of that low budgetiness and, and that and being in a location that's not exciting or not exciting to look at and uh, not a knock on david gore that was a second picture like you cannot expect magic um, from someone on their second picture even if their first picture was great you really can't expect magic until like the third, fourth, or fifth picture, and you gotta see some level of consistency there to know whether is this a director who you want to keep watching deliberately. I think Goyer definitely had had better movies later, certainly with uh, the Invisible. I think that was what it's called uh, about a dude who dies and he's a ghost. Like I, I really like that movie. I think his his control of the camera is much better in that movie. So this is not to knock David Goyer who. Uh, has gotten enough shit about Blade Trinity. Uh, <laughs> let's let's just let's just leave the cast and crew of Blade Trinity alone for this one. Uh, Patton Oswalt uh, definitely said my favorite things, but I'm sorry about mentioning any of that. Uh, but yeah, so but that's that right there is my concern. Is like you can have two movies that look fantastic and the third movie looks terrible, and then when it comes to these shows, like if you know, Daredevil, Netflix, if that show looks cinematic, and then you get to Iron Fist, and that, again, looks like it's in Canada, you just sit there and go, do I want to watch this? Because there's an expectation there that's not being met, and, it, and it's on the production level, but it's also on the writing level. You can kind of see that these things kind of all line up with each other. Uh, a good director can make a cinematic-looking show, but if the writing doesn't give them the room to do that, then that's then that's a problem too. So with the director being in mind and the and the writing, the creator of this show, Jessica Gao, hope I'm saying that right, worked on Rick and Morty and Robot Chicken and a bunch of other stuff, but I, I wrote those too because I've seen some of that. Rick and Morty is loved by everyone who watches it. And Robot Chicken, I love. So this is someone who has experience with comedy, has experience writing for popular shows, and is now basically the creator and one of the, the main writers of this show. So I gotta say, uh, I think, you know, in terms of maintaining comedy and being on the cinematic level, I think we got some good stuff here. 
the director of this episode, Kat Koiro? Cairo? Sorry, I'm butchering your name too. She just directed Marry Me. She did episodes of Shameless and Always Sunny in Philadelphia. So here's someone who has been on the cinematic level also. So we've got someone who's written for popular TV shows and someone who's directed for movies that went to the theater. Movies that go to the theater have a certain expectation you have to achieve if you want to be a director for that type of movie. And I appreciate that this episode achieved that. I think one of the best parts, everything in the trailer holds up when it's in the show. And that's a huge thing. I think a lot of movies get sold on their trailer shots. And then when you see the movie and it gets to the trailer shot, either that's the only good shot in the movie. Or you realize that the editor used just the good part of that shot. And that shot was actually a bad shot. And you're kind of just feeling like you wasted your time. Uh, so one of the distinct moments I want to point out now, casting is huge. Casting is a huge part of directing. So whoever your cast is, they all kind of have to gel with each other in a very natural way. So I'd say the casting solid on this one, as far as I can tell, no, no, no personal issues so far. It's only episode one. But I'll say one of the distinct things that makes the show look cinematic and achieve the MCU level of expectations is in the first She-Hulk test, where Tatiana is in normal human form, and she's got this metal thing on her head that's supposed to detect her brain waves, and she's in the little chamber where these saw blades come out and start coming toward her, and and Smart Hulk is outside just watching, going, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. He's not worried. He knows she's a Hulk. He's not worried about her. And she is worried because she's still human and does not fully understand how this works. And when the way it builds up, and again, this is one of those moments where you see Tatiana's comedy prowess and her natural natural qualities that make her just fun to watch. Uh, when she becomes She-Hulk, it switches to this POV where you just see the green hands and they stop the wall and break the saw blades. Uh, and, and she shoves it back and the aggressiveness of it while still looking good. And the camera then cuts to a side view of her after shoving it away. And then you see the shot of Smart Hulk going, yeah, just totally brawling out. And then she turns furious and grabs the door and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And just that, just that moment by itself, the shot choices how a director chooses the shot choices and how they build up a sequence that is what creates a cinematic experience for the audience i have one short film <laughs> i have one short film after 10 years of filmmaking that won awards and was had any clout or respect at all 007 i only need one james bond fan film and i part of my what i feel what made me and part of what I feel I did well was not, not the whole movie, but certainly certain sections of that movie. There were moments where I felt my directing really worked because I picked shots that would lead and build up to things. And it was a huge lesson for me when I was in the editing and those moments worked. And not only that, but because I'm in the editing watching my edits over and over again, I'm realizing, wow... If I had just shot one shot less and did this angle and built it up more in another type of way, I could have made this even more cinematic, where it's like maybe my, my A shot and my D shot were perfectly cinematic, but B and C were clearly just there as intentional edits to build up the sequence. I could have just done, I could have done three shots that were just had a different camera move and had a much more cinematic experience delivered. And just having that perspective always in my mind, again, the one short that won awards, having that perspective always in my mind, I look at how these movies and shows are shot, especially anything coming out of the MCU, because that is, A, that's what I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to direct, write and direct for superhero films and TV, but specifically for Marvel, and maybe a little bit for DC, but mostly for Marvel, because those were the majority cartoons I grew up with. And so as I watch these things, I'm watching for who's doing it right. 
Moon Knight did it right, and at least for this first episode on the director level, those camera choices and the natural buildup of the performances is what the director's there for. Again, uh, I mentioned this in another review, but when I watch Uncharted, those actors seem checked out. And they seem like they're just being directed by a producer who is saying, well, you acted like this in this movie, so can you just be that? You were Spider-Man, so can you just be likable and kind of have adorable reactions to the action? Because that's what we want from you. It's a very, very cause and effect, you did this in the last one type of directing that I'm not a fan of. And I'm not saying that that's what the director did, but that's the feeling you get from the movie. And, and, and however that transpired, I don't think is acceptable from the audience perspective. So to see this first episode and to see that the direction allows the actors to breathe and to be the character that they are so that the audience has that relatability. It's not about I relate to being a giant green thing. It's that I relate to being a big guy who's insecure about his strengths and weaknesses. Uh, or on Tatiana's side, uh, it's not about, oh, I, I relate to being a skinny, cute woman. It's about, I relate to being a, a woman who has a lot going on within herself and must have self-control uh, because she's afraid of what people think about her. That is relatable. That is where the emotional content and character content come out of in this episode, is these interactions between these two characters that feels natural, feels real, and I mentioned before, there's going to be some definitely anti-woke reactions to some of this conversation, but I want to say, I think I've had these conversations before, and now watching it as a show, I'm like, nah, I, I think I get it. I, I, I don't need to uh, argue with the show and, and say it's some, you know, something. I think, you know, I, I kind of understand why they would say that, and I, I'm just curious as to where they take it. And I really love when we get to that final action sequence in the episode when she's back to being a lawyer. And lawyer show. Not a lawyer show. It's a superhero show. Uh, <laughs> Better Call Saul was a lawyer show for at least four seasons. So this is not a lawyer show. Uh, when we get to that final action sequence where she actually is in court and she has to hulk out. And then we don't see her de-hulk at the end of the sequence. We just see her feet become, go green to, to normal and her walk up and put her uh, shoes back on. And then when she turns around, you see her in full as, as a normal, uh, as a normal Jen Walters. That type of, you know, you're shooting that knowing, knowing that you don't need to see the rest of her. You've already had an entire episode of seeing her transform in various different ways. You know that all you need is that one shot of her putting her heels on, and then she turns around, and the audience gets it by that point, because the rules were expressed throughout the entire episode. Now, a director has to be in, in control of that and understand how much they're showing, when and where, and why. Because you're not building up to the justice sequence. Also something I learned doing I Only Need One. You're not just building up to each individual sequence. You're building up to the final moments of the show or the episode or the movie that you want that ending to have the most impact possible. And the writing allowed that to occur, but also the directing has to follow suit. So, Cat Koiro, Cairo, hats off. But... Directing isn't the only thing. Now, the directing and the cast, that's not the only thing that makes a show cinematic. I gotta throw some love to the production design from Elena Albanese, who was a production designer for Body Cam, Sing Room, 113 Degrees. Haven't seen any of that. But she was on the art department for Free State of Jones. I saw a little bit of that. Terminator Genesis. Hate that movie, but it did have good production design. Furious 7. Don't care for those movies, but you know what? Seven was good. And Zero Dark Thirty. So she has a lot of experience on feature films and it shows and it, it, it matters and it adds to this show. Uh, the cinematography. What I love is that the cinematography lives up to the expectations of Infinity War and Endgame, which were the last time we saw Hulk. 
if Hulk is in a show and it looks like he's in a TV show shot in Canada, then the show has failed. Because we last saw him in Endgame, which had fantastic cinematography, great production design. And even if he's on a smaller scale, it needs to look like it lives up to those expectations. So the cinematographer Florian Bauhaus, I hope I'm saying your name right, also worked on Marry Me with the director, uh, but also DP'd I Feel Pretty, The Book Thief, The Devil Wears Prada. Everyone loved that movie when that came out. Marley and Me makes everyone cry. I love that movie. Uh, Flight Plan, which I have not seen yet. But this is a cinematographer who has uh, over a decade of incredible experience. So the show benefits from that cinematography. And now we will be we will see. I don't know if this DP worked on any of the future episodes, but if if the cinematography looks off, if it doesn't level up to this, I, I'm right now. I have the show playing, and it's on the scene where uh, she's eating pancakes. Oh, and <laughs> and in that scene, Bruce is like half lit, and he's a CGI character. People don't understand the cinematographer is still involved in the lighting of the computer animated aspects. And and that kind of pre-planning has to still go into li the live action shooting. He's kind of half cross lit with some soft sort of fill lighting. And it looks very natural. It looks both natural, but also cinematography, in a cinematography sense, beautiful. And that is the job of the cinematographer based on whatever the director's expecting. Some directors don't care about naturalism, uh, but naturalism is the popular thing, especially since the Dark Knight trilogy came out. And I gotta say, damn, these shots look good. These shots look good. And a cinematographer can help you make your movie or show look better, but based on their experience and them understanding what you need to get out of the, of the thing you're shooting. Uh, and now we're on the shot where she busts out the door and it looks amazing. The cinematographer, if the director doesn't know the lenses or whatever, the cinematographer's got to know, hey, well, this lens will get what you want, and this it'll look good while still being aggressive and being this kind of moving video game shot of someone yanking a door and throwing it into a wall. Uh, so all of that's fantastic. And I want to throw some love to costume designer Ann Foley. Uh, Ann Foley worked on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and uh, Altered Carbon. She's worked on a whole bunch of stuff. I started following her on Instagram after the Patriot showed up and he had this amazing like now here we are on a TV show budget Agents of Shield is definitely a show that teeters between being a TV show in terms of cinematography and expectations to kind of being like a movie and I think the costumes from the beginning were great but definitely you saw Ann Foley's strengths I would say season three on, as I think they got a little more money, and they had more interesting characters. I loved what she did with Ghost Rider season four. If you don't watch anything else of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I'm recommending season four of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Don't worry about not knowing anything. Just watch season four. Ghost Rider, this is the best cinema presentation of Ghost Rider, and he has a great origin episode. I really love his origin episode. But his costume, it's comic book accurate, but also looks great on camera. I feel like you could take that into a film, a feature film, and you're going to get the same level of quality out of that outfit that you do on the show. And that comes from Ann Foley, having a great sense of uh, style and look and what the camera is going to do to it. Because uh, it's not, uh, here's another thing, going back to Blade Trinity, there was a clear drop in the costume qualities between Blade 2 and Blade 3. Now part of this is director's vision and what the director asked for. But I think if you look, if you can, if you put the Blade 1 and 2 costumes next to the Blade Trinity costumes, there is a quality difference. And even if it's not a, necessarily a drop, I'm not saying she, that, that uh, costume designer wasn't talented. But I don't think they were the right person to do those costumes because it definitely felt more TV show like. The costumes did not have the staying visual impact power 
because it's it's a tricky thing to costume people. I mean, these are what I'm talking about: the directing, casting, production design, cinematography, and costumes. That's the hand. Those are the the five fingers of the hand that make a fist that punch you in the eyeballs and tell you, "Wow, this is a great looking movie." You know, without those five things being in proper conjunc conjunction with each other, you have a product that does not look cinema cinematic, that does not make you go, I want to keep watching. These are production, artistry, craftsman things that, when all put together, create a very good product. Now, you can, you can have movie, Kevin Smith, you know, you, you, you go back to Clerks and Mallrats, and, you know, now Mallrats certainly had better production design, but as low budget as Clerks was, his directing style and his writing were effective. So they could, the directing style and the casting and the writing, and especially at the time when people were not, were not used to the shock and awe of that kind of dialogue, uh, those were so effective that it didn't matter that the production design wasn't astounding, now that's one way of doing things, but you got to be on that level if if those production levels are going to be lower. You know, you've got to have something that's so stand out it doesn't matter whether the rest are good or not. Uh, that's certainly something the same with Christopher Nolan. If you watch The Following, his first feature film, I mean, there there's one that it's literally shot almost documentary style, but it is a feature film. And again, the writing and the directing choices, even though the cinematography wasn't fantastic. And the, again, the production design was just wherever they were. They found great locations that would look good naturally, so they didn't have to worry about having a production designer. Again, very smart directing. Outstanding directing. Now, you can get away with these things as long as other things are remarkably good. You know what I mean? But just in terms of the professional expectation of a product that people know, the five hand, the five fingers of the hand that make that happen are are those things I'm talking about, and it is on those levels that I consider She-Hulk: Attorney at Law a, a total uh, double thumbs up uh, a piece, yo. Like you nailed it, bro. Hang loose, Bretta. You know what I mean? Like on those production levels, this show is fantastic. I I, I feel it's superseded Moon Knight in terms of living up to the expectation of the big screen experience. That is what I pay attention to when I watch this stuff. That is what I'm judging everything on all the time. And again, what's what's winning here? What's winning here? I couldn't stick with Altered Carbon, but without question, those fucking costumes were fantastic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those costumes were amazing. Uh, but here here's a show that, you know, gives me my childhood back lives up to the cinematic expectation uh but also it's it's staying true to the mcu as it has been presented uh especially in the last five years but certainly since iron man in 2008 so great job team i can't wait for the next episode uh and if i don't have anything as geeky as that to say i'm not even gonna talk about the next episode so booyah <laughs> Anyway, thanks for listening to my nerdy crap. And uh, remember, don't like, don't subscribe, and don't comment. Am I talking about my show? That's up to you. Aloha. Take it, take it easy. Take a shit. Take, take out. Take out sounds good. Who's buying? Me. <laughs>